Friends, good evening. Thank you for joining us to another lecture in our pre-chamber series. This week and next week, we're going to cover the topic of psychoastrology. And the way that we have it structured in the lessons that you receive as a student of the pre-chamber is that we have split part one so that we can discuss the impact to the personality on the first few planets and then we cover the rest of the planets on part number two, which is the end of the lecture. But for the sake of those of you who are here present, we would like to give you something a little bit more than that. In this first lecture, we're going to cover all of the planetary influences in the development of the personality. When we come together next week, uh, we're going to dedicate our time so that we can see not only the influences of the planets and the archetypes in the personality, but also the influences of the planetary genie, the planetary archetypes in general, and that we can also see some of the many aspects of specific zodiac signs. I believe that this will empower you to make a better use of the hour of the day, of the day of the week, and of the planetary influence as you are conducting your day-to-day -day business. So let's start this week with the personality and the planets. And you know very well that we like to start our lectures in our pre-chamber with a quote from Samael Ambeor. Samael says, in this epoch of cosmic drone rockets, detailed studies have been made of cosmic rays and their influence on living cells and organisms in general. We cannot deny the radioactivity of the planets in space, much less their electromagnetic influence on living things. Now, last week, we spoke about this cosmic law of the Solionensis. As a matter of fact, our lecture was the Sun, the Universe, and the Solionensis. And back then, we spoke about George Slakovsky. We learned that Slakovsky was a Russian engineer. He was a scientist, an inventor, and author. And he noticed that there was a correlation between sunspots and the emergence of wars. He wrote about his findings, his studies, in, in a book titled The Secret of Life, where he speaks about cosmic rays and radiations of living beings. And that is because everyone carries within and without themselves an electromagnetic field. You may refer to it as the aura. But in addition to George Lakovsky, then there is George Ivanovic Gurdjieff, and he stated in his works, it is necessary to know a great deal in under to understand that. What is war? War is the result of planetary influences. Gurdjieff spoke per se of the law of the Solionensis. And we learned last week that this is a cyclical period of planetary tensions and unusual solar activity that is triggered by the proximity of the comet Zolni that belongs to a solar system of Baleoto. This we learned last week. For those of you who may benefit from a refresher in case you missed it, well, this cosmic law of the Solionensis is, is affected by celestial mechanics. And we know that this solar system of Baleoto in a close proximity to our solar system of Oars, well, that there is uh, a, a, a comet, Comet Zolni, that as it travels through the vastness of space and gets uh, to within that space between both solar systems, it exercises a tension. And this mutual electromagnetic strain influences the planets in our solar system. And as a consequence, well, for as long as this strain is sustained, the psyche of the human beings will experience a longing for freedom. Last week, when we spoke of this, we said the, in, the, the intense longing for religion is manifested. And we spoke... And we, clear, and, and we clarify that when we say that, we're not saying religion in terms of mystical practices and rituals and adorations, but in terms of religion in its original context, which is religare, 
which means to reunite. And that people, as they receive these influences, well, they fail to transform what that energy is. And as a consequence, their desire to reunite manifests outside of them. They see that, that deep longing of religare, of reunion, as something that has to happen of minds that are thinking alike, of values that attract each other. And a good example of of, of, of the nefarious consequences of that was the Bolshevik Revolution back in the year 1917. Interestingly enough, it's been uh, shy of a hundred years and we are seeing that uh, uh, this year we have noticed something similar in a similar area of the world where there is an intense longing for reunion, reabsorption of lands and countries into this concept of what was uh, the former Soviet Union. So planetary influences have an effect in the psyche. And the reason that happens is because we all share a common foundation. And that foundation is energy. For those of you who have a very thirsty intellect and always like to see a little bit more on, on what is it that science says as science starts converging with this millenary wisdom of Gnosis, what we see here, how is it that in terms of influencing a living organism, knowing that Earth is a living organism that sustains all of us, well, we see here from a contributor to a website called space.com from an article that was titled Tiny Solar Activity Changes Affect the Earth's Climate. The author, Charles Choi, states in his work, even small changes in solar activity can impact the Earth climate in significant and surprisingly complex ways. Very interesting article for those of you who would be interested. However, that is not of Gnosis. Let's go back into the topic of Gnosis. The planetary influences are something thoroughly understood by our ancestors. The more we continue to advance into an era of technology, and the more we fascinate ourselves with the miracles of technology today, well, uh, failing to transform the impression and the benefits and the use of all of these devices, well, it, 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 it invites us to, to just disconnect from all of this ancient wisdom. But one thing is for sure, those of you who are in your 40s, in your 50s, it is very likely that you remember your grandparents and how was it that they aligned the cultivating and the harvesting based on the faces of the moon. They knew exactly when to go harvest just as much as they knew when to go and till the land and prepare it so that they could prepare themselves for a future harvest. The same thing happened with the way in which they collected woods. Back then, they would look at specific faces of the moon and they would know when is it that it was appropriate to go out and work with a tree and thank the tree and sacrifice the tree for the sake of getting that wood and build their sheds, their homes, their cottages, etc. We see very clearly that even today, many of these woods could be 100, 200, 300, perhaps a little older years old. And they are still in phenomenal condition, resilient, resistant. However, ever since we forgot about the influence of the satellite of the Earth on the effect of plants, and we have taken uh, wood harvesting more as a financial uh, as a financial activity, well, now in that lack of alignment. The quality of the wood is substantially different, and we see, well, that now the commercial wood does not last as long as the one that our ancestors methodically waited for. And how is it that they venerated those forces of nature? And that happens because the moon, as a satellite of the Earth, well, it has a very predictive orbit. It has a very predictive behavior, and it influences anything that has to do with transactions of fluids in our planet. 
We see this because the tides rise and they fall. And in addition to that, well, knowing that our bodies are 60% uh, or so water, well, the, the moon, as it exercises, it strains on the planet. So it does with the fluids within our own body. And we know that these fluids that we have in our own body is not just water. Of course, we have plasma that is a combination of many different chemistries. And dissolved in that plasma, well, we have other components that allow for the transport of nutrients and oxygen and other substances that are vital for our existence. Among those many other substances, we have hormones and we have neurotransmitters and we have other chemistries that the body uses to trigger the activities of certain glands and organs. So when the moon is performing its work and it is exercising its influence, naturally we will see, we will see how it affects our psyche and how it affects our bodies. This happens to all of us. And it happens to all of us because we, as an energetic creature, as a condensed form of energy, well, we are no different than, than the manifestations of creation that exist in superior planes. Just like the father of all creation is a divine triunity, it is three in one, well, because of that law of the triamashikamno, and by virtue of the principle of correspondence, which is a hermetic principle that allows us to uh, remove many of those obstacles that do not allow us how to understand uh, some phenomena. That principle that states, as above, so below. Well, we are also a triunity. And for the sake of this lecture, let's state that this trinity that we are today is a combination of ego, essence, and personality. Let's start with the essence, because the essence is the same thing as the consciousness. If you hear us say essence or consciousness, well, we're speaking about the same thing. But this consciousness is also known by different names. We want you to expand that cultural foundation. We want you to know that essence, consciousness, buddhata, psyche, or tatagata, it's all the same thing. This essence is the psychic material that we have been given so that we can effectively work in superior works of creation and eventually fabricate a soul. Many people believe that they have a soul. But we still don't have a soul. Well, we still do not have a solar radiant soul. We do have a soul that is animalistic in nature. And if the essence is the most divine and pure thing that exists in us, if this consciousness is the only thing that we have incarnated today of our spirit, of our innermost, of our father who is in secret, well, we need to make use of this particular material and use it in ways that are intelligent. That means we need to give an opportunity to this consciousness to operate. That means we need to empower the consciousness to put into use the faculties, the virtues, the powers, the attributes, the laws of the being, of the innermost, of our spirit. And right now, it is challenging for us to do that because our essence, our consciousness, is not free. If we had 10% of our consciousness liberated, we would be performing miracles. If we had 50% of our consciousness free and liberated, we would be practically walking on water. If we had all of our consciousness liberated, certainly we would be in the space of the angels and the archangels. Lamentably, that is not the situation for us today. Our consciousness is trapped. But it is not only trapped, it is fragmented. Imagine that you have a very precious vase in your home and by accident you drop it and it shatters in a thousand pieces. 
The same thing has happened with our consciousness. And each one of those fragments of our consciousness is trapped inside each and every one of the many faces of our ego. In the Buddhist tradition, the ego is known as a psychological aggregate. And it is known as a psychological aggregate. Psychological, well, it is associated to the psyche. We already know that the psyche is the essence, the consciousness from the Gnostic, Gnostic perspective. And it is an aggregate because it has been added onto the consciousness. In its origin, it was not there. The psychological aggregates are a product of the creations of the consciousness. And there is a good story behind how is it that all of these aggregates came to be. Everything started with that event in which uh, those two creatures were expelled from the Garden of Eden. Certainly, there was a moment of realization, as it has been written, where they realized that they were naked. Not only they realized they were naked, they realized they had been fooled. They were told, yes, go ahead and eat of that forbidden fruit, because what's going to happen is that uh, you're going to end up being like like the gods. You're going to know the difference between good and evil. And that was incorrectly interpreted. There was a mistake that was made. There was a consumption of that forbidden fruit. And as a consequence, in that desperation, rather than working our way back through that narrow door, that is a door that, that involves of a super dynamic of love, well, we embarked into creating new things, trying to compensate for the happiness, for the joy that we have lost. After all, while we were in the Garden of Eden, we had that communion with the stars. We cannot just think of the stars, now that we're speaking of psychoastrology, as just rocks that are floating out in the firmament. These are not just big bodies of rock and gases and, and in many cases melted uh, uh, frozen, frozen ice or, or rains of diamonds that, that, that are just wandering in space by mistake. These are all bodies. And each one of these bodies, just like us, has its own consciousness. They have their own souls. And back in that Garden of Eden, we had the opportunity to converse with them, to be in communion with all of these divine great beings. But that got lost. And in that desperation, well, <laughs> we started focusing outside rather than inside. And we started creating all of these artifices of the mind, all of these aggregations into the psyche, all of these egos that, because we did not eliminate them, we have been accumulating them throughout our lives, and they have complicated our existence. So we are an essence, and that essence is fragmented, and it is trapped inside of the many egos that we carry within. So there is some of your consciousness trapped in the many faces of your anger. And there is some of your consciousness trapped in your gluttonies and in your resentments and in your ambitions. The same thing for your lusts and the same thing for your envies and your greeds and your laziness and your vanities and your prides, etc., etc. So we know that we are an essence. We know that we are an ego. And we are also a personality. But there is a key here. The personality has no future. The personality is created at its time, and soon enough, it will cease to exist. The personality is an energetic vehicle that we have created with the sole purpose of interacting with the environment that surrounds us. And the personality is meant to be at the service of the consciousness, of the essence. But because the essence is trapped, now the personality has become an instrument of expression of our ego. So this is how the ego, those many faces, those many psychological aggregates, have the opportunity to interact with other psychological aggregates of people all around us. And the personality, the essence, and the ego, they are all a condensation of energy. And if there is energy around us, it's going to affect our psyche. 
it is going to affect the way that the ego is behaving. It's going to be affecting, of course, our physicality because we know that the human vehicle, even though it is made of flesh and bone, well, through the many channels in the body, we have electrical flows of current through our nervous system. We know that our blood is indeed a very conductive type of material. And any electromagnetic influence will influence the body, physical, the body in its vital aspect, and it's going to influence the psyche. This is why we speak of the personality and the planets. And knowing that the personality starts at the moment of conception and eventually will disintegrate, then it is important for us to know what are the influences in the personality throughout the different stages of our lives and how is it that we can benefit from that? If these are free energies that are available to us, then if we're meaning to use them intelligently, well, the right thing to do is to take these energies and apply them in a way that is favorable for the projects that we run, for the relationships that we are sustaining. And of course, that we invest of those energies in a way that benefit the most people the most. So that when we are speaking about sacrificing for others, that then every effort is maximized in its efficacy, in its benefit. There are seven planets. And when we speak here of planets, we are referring to the word planet in a context that is perhaps a little different than what you learned in your science book. We are speaking here from the perspective of the etymology of the word planet. Etymology is the study of the origin of the words. And in its origin, planet means a wanderer through space. So if it is a body that is wandering through space, it is considered a planet in the most simplistic meaning of the word. And there are seven distinct planets that are known as the seven planets of alchemy. These seven planets, as you can see on the screen, they are the Sun, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Interesting that they say the Sun is a planet and that the Moon is a planet. Yes, we know that the Moon is a satellite of the Earth. We know that the Sun is a star, the, sun, the heart star of our solar system, upon which all of the other planets orbit around. But from the perspective of Gnosis, we're speaking about the seven planets of alchemy. And each one of these bodies has its own soul. And each one of these souls creates a specific influence in the development of our personality for specific durations of our life. The personality is created at the moment of conception. That is the moment where it starts. And from the age of zero to seven, well, that is a septennial in which we effectively create our personality. That is a period that is influenced by the moon. From the age of seven to 14, well, that, that, that lunar influence fades away. And the influence that comes in to guide us is the influence of Mercury. From the age of 14 to 21, well, the influence of Mercury fades away and we become influenced by Venus. From the age of 21, well, to the age of 42, three septennials, the influence of Venus fades away and we become heavily influenced by the sun. And then by the time that we get to 42 years of age, the influence of the sun fades away and we become influenced by Mars. From 49 to 56, the Martian influence fades away. We become influenced by Jupiter. And from 56 to 63, and from there on forward, we are consistently influenced by the planet Saturn. But not just the planet. It is not just that small planet close proximity to the sun, we're speaking of Mercury, that has a very small orbit in, ter in terms of terrestrial years, and that uh, when it's in a conjunction or, or in a conjecture with someone else, uh, with, with another planet, well, it creates an, an, an effect in our mind. No, no, no. <laughs> we're not trying to speak here about astrology 
from the perspective of what you will read in a horoscope. No, 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 no. We're going to give you now hermetic astrology. This is the ancient wisdom on the study of the astros, of these stars, of these celestial bodies, but more than that, of the souls of these celestial bodies and the influence that they have in you. We started speaking about the creation of the personality. And between the ages of zero and seven, where we effectively create the personality, we are under a lunar influence. That lunar influence is not the moon, but the soul of the moon, the archetype of the moon, and that is Archangel Gabriel. Gabriel, well, this is a Hebrew name. All of those endings in the letter E-L, L, it means God. Gabriel is the hero of God. And this lunar influence not only influences us mechanically with the cycles of the moon, but here we see that the archetype of the moon is crucial in a very specific event that you all know about. It's called the Annunciation. It was Archangel Gabriel, one of the two or three archangels that are mentioned in all of the sacred books, that shows up and speaks to Mary, a great master, and says, Hey, you are going to be bearing child, and that child is going to be the savior of the world. That means that Gabriel is intimately associated with conceptions. Gabriel has tremendous influence over family matters. As a matter of fact, the angels on the hierarchies of the moon, all of these hierarchies of angels that are angels of, on the processes of life, well, they are angels that, that fall under the leadership of Archangel Gabriel. It, it, it is these angels, the ones who are responsible of guiding the right zoosperm within the darkness of the feminine chamber and guiding that zoosperm until it meets the ovum and work with that transition so that there is a spark of light generated within the womb of the woman at the moment of gestation. During this time, between zero and seven years of age. The personality is, of course, being developed. And what we must know is that we have to make every possible effort to avoid conflicts, discussions, sour moments, screaming or yelling, violent situations within the home itself. Because the personality, for it to develop in a way that is healthy, it has to develop on a solid foundation. That solid foundation is the family nucleus. If that family nucleus is unstable, that personality as an energetic entity is going to be developed in ways that it's, it's going to have difficulties interacting with the environment in general. Sigmund Freud was very clever in all of his studies. And any good psychologist, any good therapist will guide you back in your timeline until a moment in which you had certain conflicts with your parents, whether your father or your mother, and particularly at those very early years of you being walking around Earth. So you see, it is during this time that we must make every effort to be kind, compassionate, patient, serene, to help build this personality without punishing it, without hurting it, without abusing it physically or emotionally or intellectually. This is our responsibility with all of these creatures as they are developing themselves. Because by the time that we get to seven years of age, the personality lets go of the hand of Archangel Gabriel and holds on to the hand of Archangel Raphael. Because Raphael is the archetype, the genie, the soul of the planet Mercury.
And Rafael means the wisdom of God. It is at the age of seven that we collectively in this humanity, in our collective subconsciousness, well, we know that it is at the age of seven where children start going to school. Yes, we can say things have changed, and now since the year of, uh, since four years old, we're leaving children in the pre pre kinder that is a daycare, and they are teaching them things. Well, yes, we're doing that because we are just too generated. But traditionally, it was at the age of seven where children walked into school so that they could start getting educated. So at the age of seven, and from that on, from there on until the age of fourteen. The personality is being taken by the hand of Archangel Raphael. And what happens with this personality is that during these seven years, this personality is like a dry sponge, ready to start absorbing information. And this personality will take in anything and everything that it can experience and will use it to nourish itself. Because it was created between zero and seven. From this point forward, all that the personality does is polish itself, form itself, harden itself. For us, as we are seeing these creatures developing between the ages of 7 to 14, well, we have to continue with the good practices that we had by the time that they were going from 0 to 7. We have to maintain an environment that is an understanding, forgiving, forgiving compassionate environment. We have to educate all of these personalities, all of these young lunar souls, we have to educate them so that they can learn to think for themselves, not just tell them what to think. We have to educate them to be inquisitive, to question things, but also to analyze respectfully, also to reflect on what they are perceiving through their senses. As we do this, then we start rising children that have a superior way of thinking as responsible adults. Well, it is during this age that we need to be wise on what is it that we expose these personalities to. Because if we are exposing them to an environment that is physically violent, whether it is in the home or artificially through movies and video games and things of, of, of the like, well, then this personality is going to start becoming numb to creating certain damages. It is going to start creating new normals with things that are indeed absolutely abnormal. But also, we have then to take advantage of these seven years to start sharing the fundamental education of a didactic that can enable the consciousness trapped within that body, within those egos, that consciousness to be free. A didactic where that consciousness can learn how to comprehend not only the effects of its own creations, but the creations themselves. Here, speaking about the many different egos that we carry within our psyche, on the side of our psychological moon that we can see, and later on in the side of the psychological moon that we cannot see as well. And so that it learns that well, so that it can apply it, so that it can shield itself in a way that is wise from negative emotions, from negative influences that exist all around us. It is at this particular time frame in the history of this creature where we can give them the necessary doctrine, didactic teaching, so that they can become superior human beings as they grow older and that they can serve others in ways way better than what we could do ourselves. As we start approaching the age of 14, we also have to start educating this personality on the need to safeguard the creative power that exists within it. And we have to educate the children about the negative effects that it has to the physicality, to the psyche, to the intellect, to the emotion of abusing of the physical body, specifically abusing of the sexual organs and expelling from the body those creative waters 
that the body can so wisely transform into hormones and enable of a phenomenal development of the human machine itself. By the time that that creature turns 14, well, it lets go of the hand of Raphael and it holds on to the hand of Archangel Uriel. Uriel is the love of God. And Uriel, as the archetype of Venus, well, he influences anything and everything that has to do with love and affinity. So anything that has to do with family, with relationships, with friends, relationships that are professional, or relationships in the community, relationships with people we love. Well, these are the, the years in which those influences are the strongest. And if we have educated that creature well between the age of 7 and 14, by the time that they walk from 14 to 21, this particular creature will have a personality that will allow them to exercise self-respect. We will not then be seeing uh, young people who are still operating within a body that has not reached maturity and that are, they are already fornicating in so many different ways, abusing of their creative energies, damaging the way that they think and see each other, going through emotional hardships that leave tremendous scars in the personality. Because Uriel influences anything that has to do with love and affinity, magnetism, it is here in this particular stage of life where we see that the egos as values, well, that the forces of attraction among them are the strongest. And of course, if the force of attraction is very strong, the force of repulsion is also going to be very strong. And this explains very well why is it that if during the first 14 years there is not a good foundation at home, by the time that the, that, that creature gets to the age of 14, well, they may get there with severe deficiencies. One of those deficiencies could be comprised of lack of trust. And it could be lack of trust to their parents. It could be lack of trust towards the school, lack of trust towards the neighbors. But nevertheless, the lack of trust towards the parents is a significant challenge. Because if they cannot go somewhere safe to ask the tough questions, to have the crucial conversations, well, now in this age, by virtue of the law of universal magnetism, they are going to gravitate towards certain friends that are going to give them all the answers that they are craving for. And in the same way, all the information that will confuse them and potentially derail them. It is likely that we have already seen enough of those examples in our life Maybe we don't have to go into that detail. But also, by the time that this creature gets to the age of 14, the males in particular, it is in this last seven years where they create a third testicular layer that releases certain hormones into the human body. The same thing happens with the woman. When the male creates that final testicular layer, those final hormones are the hormones that cement the sexuality of the creature. For those of you who have already gone through the lecture on the transmigration of the souls, it was there where we spoke of the electropsychic design. The moment of death, well, that electropsychic design, if you need a mental image, I'm, gonna, I'm going to invite you to imagine it as if it were a QR code. And that electropsychic design is an electromagnetic imprint that is going into the fecundated egg of your next life. 
So all of your con, all all of the consequences of your actions, and all of the results of the karma that you experienced in this life, well, it's going to create this type of magnetic imprint. Again, the electropsychic design that is going to bring with itself aspects of your personality, of the personality of your parents, of the values that you had now, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, just to continue giving continuity to your existence. If we are abusing of our sexual energies in this life, and we have abused of our sexual energies in our past lives, well, eventually that electropsychic design is going to start getting a little corrupted. And when that happens, by the time that we get into this third septennial of our existence, well, what we will see happening is that the at the moment of, of the formation of that third testicular layer we all know that we have xy chromosomes and that we are all essentially female until those final changes take place well it is then that the sexuality will get cemented if the electropsychic design that is regulating the development of that body comes in defective then the manifestation of that third testicular layer does not complete itself in the way that it should and as a consequence we have very loving people who are exceedingly sincere when they say, I'm not supposed to be in this body. They are bringing with them the, imp the impression of that electropsychic design of what happened in their previous life. And now they are confronting the reality of having a body of a different sexuality. And as a consequence, because of all of that abuse in those hundred or so lives, well, by the time that they incarnate and they get to the stage, then they don't know. They are sincere when they say, this is not the way it's supposed to be. So we're not here to judge them. We are not here to accuse them. We are not here to try to give them some snake oil to solve their problem. No. We have to understand that if anything, they all need of this didactic so that they can go back into making use of those creative energies so that they can then help those forces internals with the help of the external forces as well that we receive from the cosmos so that we can then bring an adjustment to that so that we can use that sexual creative energy in a way that is exceedingly productive in this life, rather than encouraging them to express themselves freely like the hippies back in the 60s and abuse of their creative powers even further adding into their sufferings. So this is Venus. From that point, we let go of the hand of Archangel Uriel and we grab onto the hand of Archangel Michael, Michael, and Michael means, if we were to translate it very grossly, whom like God. We hold on to the hand of Michael by the age of 21. And we go through 21 years holding of the hand of Michael because we need, as Samael states, we need to set our posture, our position under the sun. If anything... We need to live our life as a son to others. If you struggle understanding what that means, imagine yourself on a different life from 21 to 42, where rather than making the mistakes that you made and going through the hardships that you went through because of many accidents and poor decisions and misguidance, you have grown into an age where you have received a fundamental education, where you have received a superior knowledge, where you have learned how to use of your creative energies to get rid of the ego. And now there is enough awakened consciousness within you that your heart radiates with the light of a thousand suns where people gravitate around you because you bring to them wisdom, you bring to them security, you bring to them life. Where you can go and work with others and as part of your sacrifice, you can also help others reach the same heights where you are headed to. This is what that means. 
And of course, as we are doing this, well, in that progression from 21 to 42, by the time that we get to the age of 30, 30 being Kabbalistically a number three, which is a number of creation, that is an ideal age to find the right person to go into a space of marriage. It is at the age of 21 that men will become adults. Their physical body has completed its development. And it is at the age of 21 where the sexual creative energy becomes available for the fabrication of superior existential bodies. All of these things that you will hear later about the superior existential bodies of the being, we're speaking about solar bodies that are astral, mental, causal, buddhic, atmic in nature. These are superior bodies that eventually transform the man and grant them immortality in the astral plane. These is work with forces that give man <clears throat> the ability to develop itself until it reaches the title of the son of man. It converts men and women equally into kings and queens of creation with dominion and power over the elements with faculties like clairvoyance, inspiration, intuition, clairaudience, omniscience, telepathy, etc., etc., etc. So as we do this, by the time that we get 30, to get to 30 and we can get married, we'll naturally, not abusing of our creative energies, we will see the right person coming into our life. And we can then embark into a love that is of a superior kind, and when children are born, those children would be superior children. And because of that past experience, now we have a set of parents that are better equipped to create an even stronger foundation of love, kindness, and compassion at the home for the development of the future personalities of their children as well. This is what happens during these 21 years. But if we are abusing of our energies... If we are just drinking and fornicating and partying and just leaving things to chance, procrastinating and coming up with solutions at the last moment, well, then our life will turn out a little different later. Because when we let go of the hand of Michael and we hold on to the hand of Samael, it so happens that Archangel Samael is the soul of Mars. He is the archetype of Mars. And Samael means the justice of God. It is during the ages of 42 to 49 where karma is directly applied to us in our existence. And I will invite all of you who are in your 40s and those of you who have already passed that to look back and to see the crucial traumatic events that you experienced between the ages of 42 to 49. We have seen many friends who were living the life and suddenly they lost their jobs. They lost their homes. They saw the loss of their parents. They fell in with, with, a, with a terminal illness. They saw problems with their children or their children ran away from home. They had problems with the law, whether it was legal matters and... and uh, and lawsuits or whether they, they were justice matters and the police. But we have seen this over and over and over again. Because if we, during those 21 years where we are under the influence of the sun, if we are not planting the right seeds for the right harvest, well then, when the time for harvesting comes, between 42 and 49, what we're going to be pulling out is thorny weeds. Once we go through this period, the key to successfully complete this period between the ages of 42 and 49 is just to not complain about your karma. Because the more you rebel against it, the harsher it gets. So we have to understand that the things that are happening, they're not a punishment, but rather a medicine that is necessary to shock the consciousness so that the consciousness can go back and see what was the cause of this suffering and understanding that cause when we can modify it evidently the effect goes away so this is an opportunity for growth if 
we take wise advantage of these years, then we will be rewarded in the next cycle. But if we're complaining, if we're constantly uh, arguing with God and blaming God for everything that happens to us and we hate our life, etc., then by the time that we let go of the hand of Samael and we hold on to the hand of Archangel Zachariel, because we transition from Mars to Jupiter, then we're going to miss the opportunity of receiving the rewards for our experience in this life. Zachariel, it's a complicated name. The most beautiful definition that we can put together is the great man who guards the well of the wisdom of God. And Zachariel noticed that it has a crown in his hand. In other artistic renditions, he is shown with a staff of wisdom or a scepter and either a crown or an imperator. An imperator is a sphere of diamonds encrusted with diamonds that has a cross on it. There's a beautiful picture of, uh, of the late Queen Elizabeth holding on to an imperator in one of her, those pictures that, that, that she took many years ago. But what happens with Archangel Zachariel is that as you let go of the hand of Samael, during this seven years, Zachariel compensates you for your responsibility. If you went through that period of 21 years, being like a son to others, planting the right seeds under the light of the sun for a, for, for a fruitful harvest, and as you went through your period of karma, you received it with dignity, with kindness, with good acceptance, satisfaction, gratitude, gratefulness. And you learn from all that. By the time that you get here, Zachariel is going to hand you that crown. He's going to give you the imperator. He's going to hand you that staff of wisdom. He's going to hand you the scepter of wisdom. And you see that people between the ages of 49 to 56 that are in these favorable conditions, they have a very strong presence. They walk into a room and everybody feels them. They are natural leaders that build and, and create with others. Not, not leaders that move masses and create chaos and, and disperse lies. No, 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 no. These are leaders that move others in ways that are constructive and ways that contribute into their development. But those who fail in those previous cycles, by the time that they, give, that they get here, what Zachariel does is that they, he gives them, instead of a scepter of power, he gives them the staff of the beggars. And, well, the condition in life is dramatically different. Here we see some men who get into this age. By the time that they are 53, 54, suddenly they are desperate internally. Because subconsciously they know that they have wasted all of that past time. And they make a dramatic unconscious effort to regain an opportunity and to conquer the opportunities that have been previously lost. So suddenly they dye their hair. You see them with jet black hair. For some reason, they start dressing up as if they were in their early 20s. If they were married, they abandon the family. The guy goes and gets a sports car and then he pretends to go back in time, in his psychological time, and find a woman in her early 20s or 30s so that he can start all over again with her. We see these men that lamentably, they walk in they're like invisible. Nobody notices their presence. They speak and the quality of their word is so inferior. There is so, so, so little creative energy behind their thoughts that people do not perceive what they're saying. So they speak and people just like shrug like, what is he even talking about? That is the inferior experience. So we're still in a good situation to be grateful for the challenges that we have received, to learn from them so that Zachariel can have mercy and apply the right mercy, the right justice to us and hand us, well, what we deserve, that hopefully we can make it more favorable. Because once we're done with Zachariel, we let go of his hand and we hold on to the hand of the Ancient of Days, and that is Archangel Orifiel. Notice that Orifiel appears here. 
and you see skulls. That is because Orifiel is the angel of death. This is so known and so well understood that within the collective subconsciousness of our society, we have all agreed that by the time that you turn 55, you are a senior citizen. <laughs> by the time that you start getting close to 55, they bombard you with ARP stuff. And it is exactly at the age of 56 where we walk into this space of being considered, well, an elder. And between 56 and 63, Sakari, uh, Archangel Orifiel walks us by the hand. And it is at this time in our life where we have to start making ourselves ready for that transition. Knowing, well, that this body is just a temporary vehicle. That the personality that we created, that there is no, no need to boast whenever somebody says, oh, you have a strong personality, because that is garbage. <laughs> when the body goes into the, into the grave, the personality stays right there with the body. And as the body disintegrates, the personality so disintegrates as well. So there's no future for that personality. We have to make ourselves ready for the transition. That means that if we have been living a life that is rich in Gnostic doctrine, well, we have been working effectively with the elimination of our psychological aggregates. And certainly, the moment that we come back into a new womb, we're going to find ourselves in a superior level of being where causes, circumstances that surround us are going to be way more favorable so that we can continue the work. We know by now that we will eventually become children of our own children. So all of that Gnostic teaching, all of that Gnostic didactic that we shared with our own children, it's eventually going to continue to pay off. Because it's going to create, if we could use the word lineage, psst, in, in no other context other than to show that there is a line, like a bloodline, <laughs> It is going to create those bloodlines that are very intense in that spiritual strength. And by the time that we get to 63, well, yes, nobody just, just dies at 63. People die at 20, just like they die at 100. But what happens? Orifiel continues to walk with us. And once we get into the past 63, between 64 and 71, then we see Gabriel coming back into our life. Between 72 and 79, we see Archangel Raphael coming back into our life. Between 79 and 86, we see Archangel Uriel coming back into our life. And then instead of walking with one Archangel, then we are walking with two of them. And friends, this is what we wanted to share with you tonight in terms of the planets and the personality. We source this material from Samael's own works, from his writings on the esoteric treaties of Hermetic Astrology, and of course on his book, Fundamental Education. This has been Personality and the Planets, or Psychoastrology 1. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. May all beings be happy.